This evening we really have a special treat. Um, of course, it's with all you being here. And uh, I love that we have an opportunity as going around from table to table. Everyone seems to share that appreciation that we have a little time together twice a year to exchange friendships, catch up on things, and learn some things along the way from some of our thought leaders around the country and the planet. And this, this evening is no exception. You know, um, our speaker tonight, Dr. Adashi, I, I had a chance to, and he is, he is such a student of history. Uh, my personal history with Ellie is that um, I was a few days into my internship in Baltimore, and uh, he's heard the story once at least. Uh, I was at home, my wife was away, and I was trying to make uh, a, a dinner cake, and I didn't have enough flour. And so we lived in a place called Cross Keys, and I went a few doors down and knocked on a door, and I said, do you have any extra flour? And this gentleman opened the door, he was so nice and kind, and invited me into his, his house. We started talking, and he said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I'm starting as a resident in OBGYN. Little did I know it was Dr. Adashi. And he was so humble. I had no idea once I had my, my, my flower, which was uh, interesting, I had no idea what he did. And a uh, little time I certainly found out, and I've learned so much from him. And uh, a friendship was born with that. It's interesting that when we are going through our education, we are learning more questions to ask and certainly we know answers for. And we tend to drill down, we'll do research, going for a single question, and we come away hoping that we'll evolve with the accumulation of knowledge to continue to be relevant throughout our lives. A lot of that is just keeping up with current ideas, thoughts, and questioning settled ideas that are there. Looking back through the history, um, uh, the path, the journey that Dr. Adashi has followed, I remember reading about ovarian physiology and looking at this name and Adashi and who is that and really drill down into the fundamentals of what we understand over in physiology is uh, a real pioneer among us tonight. At the same time, times were changing and although it's so important to understand how our bodies can operate and function, it's paramount to be able to help other people to maintain the function of their bodies throughout their lives. And that comes to evolve to an area from zooming in where Dr. Dashi has really zoomed out into healthcare, public policy, and the delivery of just healthcare, or if you will, the just delivery of healthcare, justice in caring for everyone in our country and our society. And he has been involved in such ways that it required continuing medical education, in a sense. So, although he's very distinguished in his education and institutions that he's been um, learning through and also teaching us in, he went back to Harvard to learn more about health care, health policy. So, in his continuing med medical education, he continues to be a relevant leader and thought leader in our society in moving us forward and reminding us the direction of where forward is and where it goes. Although I could go on about the accolades, uh, what we've learned, what he's accomplished, if I start going into these big numbers of 350 publications, and the most and the best, we're going to start to think this is a pre presidential campaign tonight, that something's got to be the biggest or the best. Um, and of course, that um, no one can say we can solve everyone's problems, or any one person has all the solutions. But Eliadashi has really been very creative and has been not just a standard bearer and banner of ideas, but is leading us in a path of how we can actually implement them. Even as the president speaker at ASRM this year speaking to the issue of access of healthcare and fair and just access to healthcare. But although he zoomed out to that, tonight he's going to zoom to the future where things are at. Tonight is uh, we were all speaking and Gary Smith was uh, going back to uh, talk t about his uh, uh, University of Chicago mentors, um, Arthur Herbst, 
at Herb's, and about 20 years ago, he looked at Gary, and Gary can tell this story much better than me, but I'll paraphrase a little bit, saying, hey, there's something going on. The future's going to be egg freezing. It's back in 1996. Sums up. You should get into that. And here we are, uh, 96, 2006, 2016, 20 years later, look who we, where we are. And this is the gentleman that introduced our awareness of the effects of DES, Dr. Herbst, on not only a woman's, and now we understand, a male's reproductive system. So these are, are folks that have real foresight. And tonight, um, Dr. Adashi is going to describe to us where there may be a future that even for some of our wonderful sponsors tonight, they may not be so happy, but they may have to have new products that stimulate, not ovaries, but stimulate things only in a Petri dish. And we will not be admitting people to the hospital to drain fluid from a Petri dish for the variant hyperstimulation syndrome. And to think that someday, and as I was talking to Ellie earlier today in my bad humor, um, as we'll speak tonight about getting cells perhaps from a buccal smear, that the old saying that, you know, all I did was kiss her and she got pregnant may turn out to be a reality. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce to you, wonderfully so and humbly so, Dr. Ellie Adashi. Oh. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's rare that I find myself among my people. Uh, I speak to all kinds of audiences, but it's very rare that I actually get to speak to fellow reproductive endocrinologists, embryologists, and other members of the reproductive endocrine team. And so from that point of view, I'm especially delighted in that I'm speaking to the Cognicenti, uh, who can probably appreciate uh, what we are going to be discussing today. I myself, as I think about the prospect of eggs and sperm from a buccal smear, I myself continue to pinch myself and say to myself, this is really mind-boggling. Uh, but the reality is that that train has left the station. And while it has not yet reached the human context, it's made dramatic strides uh, in the rodent. Um, those of you who may have had the time during the ASRM may have noted or recall that during that very week, a very important paper saw press in Nature describing the complete in vitro generation of uh, M2 oocytes in the rodent. And so this is happening. Uh, it's been happening now for about 15 years and it's accelerating. And we'll talk about also the pace of science as it stands today as opposed to the way it was perhaps when some of us went to undergrad or to medical school. Things have changed dramatically just in terms of the pace of progress and the way things move forward. But to begin at the beginning, all the uh, absolutely correct insights provided by Mike notwithstanding, one of our perhaps most significant interests is in the leading edge of reproductive medicine. That is to say the future, what is happening that might be realized possibly in our lifetime, possibly not. And I count amongst these uh, elements, of course, mitochondrial replacement, and I know all of you know all about so-called three-parent babies and the recent episode which transpired in Mexico. We will not talk about that tonight. You all know at least about the possibility of editing the genome of the human embryo to prevent rare monogenic diseases, 
and perhaps do other things, which raises a variety of challenging ethical issues. And lastly, I would put in that list the idea of in vitro gametogenesis, which in principle, and we will say more about it, could be used to reverse genetic or iatrogenic germ cell failure. But to begin at, at the beginning, it's always interesting to recall that Dr. Haldane, who was an evolutionary biologist uh, who lived and worked in the United Kingdom, in his book, Daedalus, Science and the Future, which was published in 19, 1923, and his co-conspirator, Aldous Huxley, another remarkable thinker of that time, through his book, Brave New World, which was published in 1932, predicted that in time we will be generating eggs via ex vivo ovarian cultures. The notion being that you could exteriorize um, human ovarian tissues and maintain them ex vivo by appropriate perfusion and in fact recapitulate the menstrual cycle, if you will, on an ongoing basis, albeit entirely ex vivo. That of course never happened and in all likelihood will never happen. But even simpler projections such as whole explants cultured in vitro, uh, which clearly have been attempted, or follicular culture systems that have been attempted, have on balance not quite materialized to, or have not quite lived up to the hopes that I think some of their originators had in mind. On the other hand, the prediction that embryos will be generated via in vitro fertilization was of course spot on, and pretty much everybody in this room of course is practicing this art, which uh, at this point is uh, barely 40 years old. Uh, Louise Joy Brown, was, is not yet quite 40 years old, although she will be in 2018. And lastly, Haldane and Huxley predicted that newborns at some point will arrive via ex vivo ectogenesis. The same notion we mentioned earlier for ex vivo ovarian preparations. The notion that we could actually grow a human being in a lab context outside the intended environment of the uterus. Of course, that may never happen, and if it is going to happen, is a long way away. But I will draw your attention to two important nature papers that saw press earlier this year, wherein human embryos were grown all the way to day 14 of life, which would be beyond the pre-implantation period and into early life, if you will. And the only reason the investigators stopped at day 14 was because day 14 on balance is viewed as the legal and moral limit uh, beyond which one should not grow human embryos in a dish. In uh, the United Kingdom, this particular restriction is written into law, so there really is no way of circumventing that. Uh, but there is, uh, I think, a general agreement for a variety of reasons that day 14 constitutes some sort of a magic barrier that at this point is morally uh, the end of the line. I will mention, however, that um, in a few days a conference is going to take place at Harvard which will be dedicated precisely to this question, 
what is so magic about day 14? And could we, should we, will we go beyond that point? We're not going to elaborate on this issue. Suffice it to say, though, that these notions of the future have been with us now for quite some time. And while they haven't all materialized, they seem to be gradually falling into place, IVF perhaps leading the charge. One thing that Haldane and Huxley, though, never even imagined was the notion we will be discussing today, that is to say, the generation of eggs and sperm from a buccal smear. And I say buccal smear only because most physicians are very familiar with buccal smears. It is ultimately the quintessential somatic cell that is readily accessible that we can then subject to various laboratory evaluations, and hence the choice of the term buccal smear. You could, of course, start with a skin biopsy if that's what you chose to do. But of course, to be non-invasive and simple and keep it uh, within reason, a buccal smear seems like a good place to start. And the reason this never occurred to Haldane and or to Huxley was the so-called germline soma barrier hypothesis, which prevailed at that time and did so for many decades after having been formulated by August Weismann, an evolutionary biologist from Germany, who is thought by many to be second only to Darwin in his overall contributions and reputation, who in his book, the germplasm, a theory of heredity, formulated the so-called germ soma barrier, which means that the germline, as we know it, will of course give rise to the soma. But the soma, as he articulated so well, never gives rise to the germline. The germline, by its very nature, is immortal because it's passed on from generation to generation whereas the soma is mortal and passes on when we do. What has changed, though, since August Weismann, and there was no way for him or for Huxley or for Haldane to imagine such, is the fact that the dogma that the soma never gives rise to a germline has now been shattered. And it was shattered essentially when we discovered the phenomenon of somatic cell reprogramming, that is to say, taking a mature somatic cell and reprogramming it into a pluripotent stem cells, which can be accomplished by one of two techniques, one known as somatic cell nuclear transfer and one known as induction, both of which were recognized by the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine to Dr. Garden and Dr. Yamanaka, respectively. So it's not been all that long ago that all of this came to pass, but no longer is the so-called soma germline barrier notion valid anymore. The idea then is to begin with a somatic cell perhaps a buccal smear, and reprogram that somatic cell into a pluripotent stem cell, a cell that could evolve into any kind of cell that we know of in the differentiated human being. And then proceed from there and differentiate or fate specify a pluripotent stem cell towards primordial germ cell-like cells in vitro and thereafter further differentiate those primordial germ cells into mature gametes. That is the idea of in vitro gametogenesis. I could, of course, have replaced gametes with lung cell or a cardiac cell or a brain cell. Uh, the principle is the same. But to us in reproduction, and perhaps because of the unique nature of the germ cell line, uh, 
this remains a far more mind-boggling proposition than perhaps the somatic cells or the examples of somatic cells that I just mentioned. Now to do that, you would have to appreciate and understand what we call the germ cell specification pathway, that is to say, the cues that are required, the sequence by which they are applied, and the timing thereof. Think of it as the software or the program that is required when a pluripotent stem cell is primed to become a gamete. That transformation requires a whole host of factors that are applied in a sequential fashion with a certain timing sequence. And that type of program or germ cell specification pathway is what you need to know if you're going to take a pluripotent stem cell on the one hand and end up with a mature germ cell. This field, in my mind, began quasi-officially in 2003, so really just 13 years ago, when Hans Schoeller, who at the time was still a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, reported on the pages of science on the derivation of oocytes from mouse embryonic stem cells. That was probably the first meaningful report that I can find that approximates what we refer to today as in vitro gametogenesis. He was followed by a triumvirate of, I would say, the high priests of in vitro gametogenesis who are interestingly interrelated in a variety of ways that I think are interesting to us. The most senior gentleman in this triumvirate is Dr. Azim Surani from the University of Cambridge, a truly distinguished cell biologist who was a graduate student of Bob Edwards. Imagine that. Dr. Surani, in turn, had a postdoc in the form of Mitinori Saitu from Kyoto University, to whom I made a pilgrimage and appropriately bowed in front of. Uh, he is one of the high priests of the field. And his associate, Katushiko Hayashi, originally from Kyoto University, but now on his own at Kyushu University. These two young men uh, themselves <laughs> were postdocs of Dr. Surani. And so you can tell that there is a fairly inbred group of scientists who have made this field their goal and have gone about it in a very powerful way in mul with multiple high-impact papers over the last 15 years. I would say that the first decade of this century uh, was dedicated to defining the germ cell specification pathway of the rodent. And I'm listing here just a few high impact papers that were authored by Surani or Saitu and that began to unravel what I call the germ cell specification pathway, the cues the sequence by which they are applied and the timing that they require if you are to end up with a mature gamete. I would say that only in the last five years or thereabouts, the germ cell specification pathway in the human has begun to be delineated in a series of uh, high impact papers again uh, contributed by Surani, this time Scholler, and Dr. Pera from Montana State University, previously from Stanford, <coughs> such that we are beginning to appreciate the germ cell specification pathway in the human, which is relevant to the possibility that we are moving forward uh, 
on that track as well and that we might at some point be in a position to repeat the feat that is currently accomplishable in the rodent in the human. What we have learned though through these 15 years of studies is what you probably could have predicted and that is that a rodent is not a human and that the germ cell specification program is not conserved between these two species and that the genetic networks involved are distinct and different. And so it's not going to be enough to simply understand the sequence in the rodent. We would have to do the hard work that it would take to figure out the sequence in the human. So what we found ourselves, I would say, in March of this year was a situation whereby you could probably reliably and effectively convert stem cells into primordial germ cell-like cells in vitro. But we were hard-pressed to be able to convert those cells into actual haploid, post-meiotic, mature gametes. In a word, we have emulated or recapitulated in vitro the extragonadal component of gametogenesis, but we have, at that point, failed to recapitulate the intragonadal component of gametogenesis. In a sense, the final frontier was eluding us at the time because one could not claim at that point in vitro gametogenesis all the way, if you will. However, in March of this year, Dr. Zhao of the State Key Laboratory in Beijing reported on the pages of Cell Stem Cell a paper titled Complete Meiosis from Embryonic Stem Cell Derived Germ Cells in vitro, the general framework of which is shown here. I'll come back to that in just a minute. If this paper is in fact reproduced, then in all likelihood, Dr. Zhao's paper, in hindsight, will have constituted the first documentation of complete in vitro gametogenesis in this case of male gametes, in the rodent. Dr. Zhao was acutely aware of what it takes to verify, or shall we say, convince the skeptics that he was actually dealing with mature gametes. Uh, those so-called gold standards that were laid out to define in vitro derived germ cells were published in 2014 by Marianne Handel, John Epic, and John Cimenti, well-known uh, uh, germ biologists, all from, or some of whom uh, mostly were from the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, who defined the gold standards as demonstrating correct nuclear DNA content in the generated gametes demonstrating normal chromosome content and organization, appropriate synapses and recombination, and of course, documenting a viable euploid offspring because that is ultimately, of course, how a gamete can in fact demonstrate its uh, functionality and utility. The starting material that Dr. Zhao used were embryonic stem cells in the rodent, which were differentiated, as we have talked about before, into primordial germ cell-like cells. They were then mixed with somatic cells derived from a mouse that was germ cell free, so only somatic cells, allowed to aggregate and in due course in vitro have generated haploid spermatid-like cells which upon utilization with ICSI, or perhaps I should say ROSI, gave rise to viable offspring. 
A variety of cytokines were used, and you can look at those. There are probably too many for us to go over. Uh, many uh, individuals who read this paper carefully also noted that one of the elements used, the uh, BPE, which stands for bovine pituitary extract, was obviously an ill-defined component, the ingredients of which have yet to be defined, and that raised a question mark, a small question mark, about the findings. But overall, uh, this paper uh, broke the field, if you will, at least on the rodent side. And as I said, while we were at the ASRM that very week, a seminar paper was published in Nature, um, the leading protagonists of which were Saitu and Hayashu, which performed the same feat, but this time in the female rodent generating M2 oocytes and eventually live progeny, who gave rise to live progeny and so forth. So clearly in the rodent, we are now in a position to take a stem cell, an undifferentiated stem cells, likely generated from a somatic cell or from an embryo, which would be the same thing, although that would be impractical, perhaps in the human, and generate mature gametes at the end of the line in the rodent. If this ever is to be extended to the human, we would have to have just as good an understanding of the germ cell specification pathway in the human. And that, at this point, is work in progress. We just don't have that. Although, with the way things are going and moving, uh, every day I turn on the computer, I wonder what will appear on my screen. What is next? Uh, and I don't know that I'll fall off my chair if I saw a paper from Surani's lab or from Saito's lab that would in fact begin to address these residual issues. The other, I think, limiting issue here is that you need somatic cells for gamete maturation and generation. Uh, in the male side, that would be the seminiferous tubule that provides that niche for the maturation of the gametes, and that has been, to some degree, recapitulated in vitro, as we have seen. In the female, uh, those would be either granulosa and or theca cells that would be more difficult probably to derive in the human uh, unless one were in a position to in fact take stem cells towards granulosa cells or towards theca cells, all of which is entirely possible and has been attempted, and then combine the two so as to complete the sequence. So again, I would not be completely surprised if that were to be the case for this to be entirely in vitro, it has to be entirely in vitro. You cannot uh, retrieve granulosa cells, shall we say, or retrieve theca cells. I mean, certainly not theca cells. And um, call it an in vitro, in vitro gametogenesis. So unlike the rodent where we are allowed this uh, uh, discretion, uh, that's not going to work for the human, and we're going to have to figure out a way to come up with somatic cells, without which it's unlikely that complete in vitro gametogenesis will transpire. Assuming this is all upon us someday, the scientific and translational promise is absolutely mind-boggling. First of all, IVG harbors the prospect of the advancement of science uh, 
by the generation of essentially an inexhaustible supply of germ cells, which could be subjected to functional non-mutant analysis, for example, and could be used for the study of germ somatic cell interactions, which to this day, as you know, is still terribly poorly understood after all these years. We really don't know exactly what the granulosa cell is telling the oocyte and vice versa, or what the theca cell might be telling the granulosa cell, perhaps even the oocyte, and vice versa. But we know that that intimate coexistence is essential for meiosis to be completed in the female germline. And so being able to study all of that in vitro would be obviously extremely instructive. IVG also harbors a therapeutic future, that is to say the reversal of germ cell failure due to many reasons you know of and for which we now have a whole infrastructure designed to cryopreserve and protect uh, individuals who might be or are in danger of losing their germ cell function. We could engage in autologous gamete replacement in individuals who no longer have gametes by retrieving somatic cells, converting them into gametes, even after they have undergone irradiation or chemotherapy and the like, at least in principle. We could even gene edit those gametes to the extent that the infertility is genetically determined, which sometimes is clearly the case. And we could apply this technology to mitochondrial replacement therapy someday, which at present is rate limited by the availability of donor oocytes. Lastly, on a much broader scale, this technology could allow us to generate autologous-induced pluripotent stem cells, which in turn could be differentiated into lungs, heart, kidneys, and the like. And because they are autologous, they will not run into the risk of rejection. And that's the whole power of obviously taking a stem cell that is a person stem cell creating the necessary tissue to be transplanted and transplanting it without generation, without rejection. And that would probably entail somatic cell nuclear transfer in terms of the technology that would be required. To people like us, this would mean a big change in the business of IVF. We don't know when, we don't know if, but I think it's something we need to begin to consider in our long-term outlook. As Mike uh, briefly alluded to, in principle, this would eliminate the need in ovarian stimulation and in egg retrieval. In principle, this will eliminate the need in egg donation. In principle, this could convert IVF to a laboratory procedure, which those of us who have trained and were boarded in reproductive endocrinology have to wonder about. What are we going to be doing in 30 years? And I want to come back to that point. And perhaps, although capitalism at its best and at its worst finds ways to mark up everything. And so whether or not this will lead to improved affordability and access, I think remains to be seen, even though strictly speaking, it's a laboratory procedure, but we'll see when we get there. So this has potentially profound implications for the very discipline of reproductive endocrinology which has evolved from what we used to call reproductive endocrinology to a heavy emphasis on IVF. 
Are we going to be going back to reproductive endocrinology when and if in vitro gametogenesis comes about? I don't know, of course, but we need to begin to mull this over as we move forward. I'd like to conclude with just a few comments that pertain to new reproductive technologies in general. IVG will be simply one more. This is at this point far enough for most people's radar screen that it hasn't really caught the public's attention in a big way, hasn't caught the attention of Congress in a big way. Um, and so at this point, the water is still relatively calm. But we know that these things tend to create a significant initial backlash. And we know that something like this will undoubtedly come under FDA jurisdiction, as is the case now in embryology laboratories. Uh, the entity within the FDA that will likely regulate these eggs and sperm will be the Center for Biologic Evaluation and Research. And they regulate eggs and sperm as human cells, tissues, and product, which in FDA lingo is known as HCT slash P's as an abbreviation. And shown here is in fact the document that empowers the FDA to regulate eggs and sperm as a drug essentially and as a product uh, without which uh, no human experimentation and no clinical use of in vitro derived gametes will ever proceed. This document was last updated in 2009. Mind you, it was triggered at the time by the so-called mitochondrial transfer work that Jacques Cohen and others did in the late 90s and early 2000s. The FDA realized that it didn't quite appropriately and convincingly assert its jurisdiction and it came out with a series of uh, announcements and regulations, one of which is the one I'm showing here. So semen, oocytes, and embryos, of course. Going all the way back to Copernicus, Galileo, IVF, you name it, any major scientific breakthrough, humanity is invariably jolted and invariably lashes back, at least temporarily, before we ultimately get over it, because it's so foreign to us, because it completely disrupts our worldview as to how things were or used to be. A man, a woman, a child. That was the situation for millennia. Now it's sex without reproduction, reproduction without sex, and here we are going to in vitro gametogenesis. There's bound to be a reaction at some point. Philip Ball, who is a very perceptive British writer, has written about this in The Lancet in 2014, and I'm simply going to quote, there is no great invention from fire to flying which has not been hailed as an insult to some god. But if every physical and chemical invention is a blasphemy, every biological invention is a perversion. There is hardly one which on first being brought to the notice of an observer from any nation which has not previously heard of their existence would not appear to him as indecent and unnatural. And when you go back to the environment which surrounded the coming of IVF, you realize that Edwards and Steptoe were called all kinds of names. Frankenstein entered the picture and worse. And so we need to be prepared for the fact that virtually any breakthrough, this one in all likelihood included,
will generate some strong feelings. This has sometimes been referred to as a fear of altering the natural order known to men for millennia, fear of revising the laws of nature or of tampering with creation, fear of trust betrayed and of technology running unchecked, examples of which I think we can all think about, fear of the first inhuman imponderable, the whole idea that something would be first tested in the human, never having been done before, without knowing what the outcome truly will be until we actually do the experiment. And the notions that the transferring of an embryo by embryo in Edwards would give rise to all kinds of unimaginable monsters was prevalent at the time. And to this day, after generations of first in human experiments, whether it's vaccination or some other experiment, that's always been a huge barrier for us as humanity to cross. It tends to be a fear that is resistant to cerebral and utilitarian arguments that is all too often aggravated by charged phrases that you all know, slippery slope, playing God, or crossing a line. Terms that come back and over and over again, irrespective of what the scientific breakthrough might be because of this conditioned response of humanity to novelty and to innovation that it is not yet ready to embrace or is finding difficult to digest at this point in our collective evolution. When and if IVG ever comes to pass, we now have learned from our experience with mitochondrial replacement therapy and a little bit from our experience with the potential editing of the genome of the human embryo that we need to do certain things to overcome these fears and to calm the public that we can in fact proceed with reasonable safety and that precautions are being taken and that scholarly bodies, among other things, have given it serious thought. We have an academy of medicine that could study IVG and provide us with all the potential pitfalls, concerns, ethical minefields and the like. That's a body that is unconflicted by its very nature, really the only American body that has no conflict of interest, speaking, strictly speaking. It's not dependent on dues and it's not made up of a particular profession. There is something known as the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues that is highly respected, has been around now for at least 20 years, different presidents appoint their own commissions. And there is the Hastings Center, a highly respected ethics center in upstate New York that uh, could also be called upon to provide unvarnished, unconflicted report on the ethics of IVG or a related reproductive breakthrough. But that is not enough. We also need to do what we have never done, especially in the United States, public engagement. When the United Kingdom approved mitochondrial replacement therapy, they spent a year asking the public for its thoughts, opinions, recommendations. And it took multiple forms and it took a significant investment. But at the end of the day, the UK government actually had a pretty good idea of what the British people really thought about mitochondrial replacement therapy. And what the British people said was that this is justified because of the terrible misery that the children born to carrier mothers with mitochondrial disease is simply intolerable and it warrants moving forward 
with mitochondrial replacement therapy. And so now it's enacted into law in the United Kingdom that we can perform spindle replacement and pronuclear replacement in the United Kingdom. They haven't done it yet, but it's now written into law and is permissible and completely legal. We have had an IOM report on mitochondrial replacement therapy, but we have yet to have public engagement on any serious issue such as this. Those of you who participated in FDA advisory committee meetings know that one afternoon is dedicated to public input. But that's just two or three hours where essentially interest groups come and articulate their concerns or their support for whatever the issue is that is being debated. But never in our history have we really embarked on what is essentially a broad public engagement that would allow us at the end of the day to have some sense of what the American people really think about the issues. The possibility that that could take place in the UK arose a long time ago when they discussed genetic modification of foods, for example. This wasn't the first time with mitochondrial replacement therapy. They have a long history, a long tradition of asking the citizenry for their opinion. And I cannot think of a more appropriate thing to do in a pluralist democracy such as ours. It's not easy, it's costly, it may be confusing, but remember, each time the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid issue a new regulation, they have to publish it in the Federal Register. And for about three or four months, anybody can comment on it. And they may get 50,000 comments at times on what they're planning to do. How they deal with it and what they do with it is a different story. But that's an example, I think, of a modicum of democracy in action. And I say, let's take it a step further and really ask the American public at large as to what it thinks. The ethics of IVG is complex and beyond the time that we have today uh, because it contains conflicting principles. Of course, first and foremost is non-maleficence. Uh, we want to be sure that the children that may be born with this technology will be healthy in every possible way. There is altruism and beneficence involved for individuals who no longer have germ cell function, for example, who could benefit from this technology and for whom we feel and whom we want to help. And we do this as we speak. This will simply be a different way of helping these same individuals. It would respect, we hope, an individual's procreative autonomy and would give the patient himself or herself the right to agree or disagree, just like we do today when we have a discussion, let's say, on single embryo transfer, double embryo transfer, to a point patient autonomy is obviously critical in this context. And there'll be issues of consent here because one can obtain a somatic cell from a whole lot of sources. And that is a troubling thought, including children, unsuspecting children, from whom somatic cells could be derived. And so great care and sophisticated regulatory terms would have to be in place to assure all of us that there is no abuse of this powerful technology. So as I close, I would say we can probably all agree that IVG, if it were to happen, will be disruptive uh, in the context of disruptive technologies. It will also be uncertain for a while in terms of its outcome. And some might say it is far off 
But I would say that making that prediction is probably no more reliable than reading cards, palms, tea leaves, or crystal balls, and for that matter, the writing on the wall, all of which represent high-risk propositions. It took about 50 years for the body of knowledge we currently possess to drive what we call contemporary science and medicine today. Yes, we always knew about the anatomy and the histology, but molecular medicine, everything we know today, essentially happened after the Second World War. The notion that it would take another 50 years to double that body of insight, I think is history. How long will it take to double our body of insights? I don't know, but if Moore's law, which applies to computer processing power, is used as an analogy, I cannot help but think that we will be seeing IVG and other breakthroughs at a much faster clip than we ever used to before. I don't know about you, but I find the speed of discovery and the way these insights are coming to me through my computer screen to be remarkable, baffling, and jolting. And so, when I say I won't be surprised if next week I saw a paper by Surani describing perhaps the entire process in the human in vitro, I mean that. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I think those possibilities must be kept in mind because the pace of science is not what it used to be. And we are moving at a far greater and faster clip. So stay tuned. And when and if we meet again, <laughs> hopefully five years from now, let's say, Mike, keep that in mind, uh, I'll provide the progress report. And we'll see how much uh, how many of my speculations tonight uh, have materialized in any meaningful way. So thank you very much for your time.